Hello, my name is Dr. Gerard Puccio, and this is what we call Dissecting Creativity, an ongoing program in which we examine the topic of creativity with experts. Today's session is being filmed as part of the Creativity Expert Exchange, and we are celebrating our 50th anniversary at the International Center for Studies in Creativity. Welcome to Dissecting Creativity. Today we have three panelists who are joining me, experts in the topic of creative education, creativity research. I'll introduce each panelist and then we'll jump into some questions that are aimed at helping us to really look at creativity closely and also to really understand how these experts personally relate to the topic of creativity. So we're not only dissecting the topic of creativity, but we're also trying to understand these individuals as experts and why they're passionate about teaching and researching creativity. So welcome, thanks for joining me. Uh, first we have Dr. Uh, Yale Katz, who is the Dean of um, uh, Sheridan College and is the Director of the Creativity Institute. Yale, welcome to Dissecting Creativity. Next to Yale we have Ron Baghetto, who is a professor at the University of Connecticut and it is the editor of the longest running journal in the field of creativity, the creativity, I was gonna say creativity research <laughs> journal, sorry, that's Mark. The Journal of Creative Behavior, Ron, thank you for joining us. Thank you. And finally, we have Mark Runko, who is a professor in educational psychology at the University of Georgia, and has initiated the creativity research journal and has been a long time researcher in the field of creativity. So thanks so much for, for joining us. I really appreciate your time. So we'll start with a, a big question, one that has uh, been perhaps uh, a point of contention for the field of creativity as an area of study, and that is the issue of definition. So if you're going to study a topic, how do you define that topic? And so we'll start with Yale and look at your take on creativity and you can approach it both from the perspective as a scholar who's looked at the literature, but also as someone who is leading an initiative at Sheridan College as a creative campus, perhaps in more informal ways, how you might describe creativity to others. So, Yale? Sure. So, to me personally, creativity is the ability to effect meaningful change you know, in oneself, in others, in the world. Um, you know, I think it is at the fundamental core of how we find meaning as human beings. And when I'm asked to describe it, um, I often refer to it as the ability to engage in new ways of seeing, new ways of understanding, new ways of knowledge. I do like to say that definitions of creativity, to your point, reside on a spectrum of mm. possibilities. And I don't just say that to say it. I, I think that, you know, it is very, um, subjective how each individual relates to the process of creativity. Mm -hmm. Now, as a field of study, I would emphasize that it's first and foremost a cross-disciplinary area of research, of thought, of practice, um, that involves paying close attention to the processes and the environment which enables new ways of thinking, um, new ways of thinking to um, effect some kind of a meaningful change, otherwise known as innovation, mm -hmm. which in turn requires more new thinking. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think it's super important today's post-secondary landscape where, as we've heard you say this morning, we are wanting to, uh, first of all, we want to, to texture and to refine the process of learning itself, but also wanting to prepare graduates for the 21st century. Mm -hmm. And beyond that, compel them to come out as thought leaders who are able to transform their respective fields of study themselves. Mm -hmm. And so I think it is tricky as a field of study um, it's a meta field, it's cross-disciplinary, but that does not take away from the depth um, of influence that this area of research could have on all fields. So as an educational leader, if we sort of focus in a bit on the work that you've been doing to lead this Creativity Institute and so much involved in the Creative Campus Initiative at Sheridan College with your three campuses and 20-some thousand students and uh, initiating a certificate in creativity when you're talking to parents uh, or students and you're trying to express the value of a, a course in creativity or the certificate program, 
how do you capture for them the value of uh, creative education or creativity courses? That's a good question. So we're very fortunate in that the students who have taken the certificate now capture that value for us, <laughs> so they can articulate it much better Biggest than I can. Biggest proponents, I'm sure. Um, I think students today, more than ever, need to be equipped with the processes and the tools in order to be able to engage in purposeful new thinking, um, you know, be it the capacity to take risks, the capacity to solve problems, uh, the capacity to do meaningful research, and so on and so forth. Um, they must have those purposeful set of skills and tools to be able to thrive. And we at Sheridan take that very seriously. We provide those opportunities for every student in every degree program, opportunities that are um, electives. But I think it's important to say too, Gerard, on that note, that I feel that students learn creativity skills, or what we refer to as creativity skills, in their home programs too. So across programs, they might be, you know, these types of learnings might be conceived of differently in each program. But in some implicit or explicit way, whether you're in the arts or in engineering or in health studies or you know, whatever you're there to, to learn, uh, students must, by necessity, learn the capacity to think creatively. What we're able to do is to take a very deep and meaningful approach to enabling them to reflect on that across fields within their respective areas. And so I think our students come out more confident, they come out more marketable, they're prepared to you know, switch jobs, 20 more times than, you know, I would have uh, been prepared for, and I think that's, that's crucial for them. Makes sense. Great. Yeah. Thank you. So, Mark and Ron, I'm going to turn to you two as scholars in the field, a long time wrestling with this as a research topic, but you are both professors and educators as well. You're welcome to take it from either angle, but I know when I talk with others, the, the lay person, the implicit view is that this is a fuzzy, fuzzy topic. So how do you, I'm gonna to go to you first, Ron, okay. and then to Mark, how do you define or describe, doesn't have to be a definition, could be a description, how do you describe it to others? Well, uh, I'll start with myself. I think what I find most compelling about creativity is, and the way I kind of personally think about it, is a way to productively resolve uncertainty. All right, so that's pretty nebulous as well. But I also, as a creativity researcher, adhere to what I think many colleagues, um, and I think Mark will probably speak to this as well, this, these two criteria of um, originality, some blend of originality and effectiveness, or, or what I would like to say, because I work in education, meeting task constraints, as defined within the context. But I think giving people a definition like that isn't necessarily helpful. So what I usually do with folks that, um, maybe are new to uh, thinking about creativity in a systematic way, is I usually try to introduce these criteria by way of example. So one of my favorite examples, and I'm often speaking with educators, K through 12, but also higher ed, is to present them with a little scenario. So imagine two kids, they're in elementary school, they're presented with the problem 26 minus 17, okay? And so one child um, ends up writing this little haiku, this little poem and uses a bonsai tree as a metaphor for putting forth this argument that even through subtra subtraction, you can add beauty, right? As you prune away the tree, it releases beauty. And you know, maybe this brings a tear to your eye and so on. But I often ask then, so do you think that's a creative response of this child? And a lot of people would say, yeah, that's creative. And then, then I feel like, you know, unfortunately bursting folks' bubbles, and I say, well, you know, many creativity researchers, including myself, would say, that's an original response, but in the context of this math problem, it's not creative, all right? And so I'll let that rest for a moment. Then I'll say, let's look at another student. So imagine this kid gets the correct answer, 26 minus 17, nine. And as a good teacher, the teacher says, oh, how'd you get that? And the kid says, well, I added three back to six and I got nine. Now that's an unusual response. And I think in classrooms, because kids are still developing their capacity, Sometimes um, a potentially creative response can look like misunderstanding. It can look like um, woefully trying to disrupt the classroom. So it can last, look like you know, a classroom behavior issue. Or it could be a signifier of, of creativity. So I think you have to kind of dig underneath that and say, help us ha to understand how 3 plus 6 equals 9 in the context of 26 minus 17. So this, this is based on actually a second grade student's response that I've seen video footage of. And this kid said, 
All right, I have 26 minus 17. I take the 6 and 7 and set them aside for a moment because I know 20 minus 10 is 10. Then I take my 7, subtract it from that 10. That gives me 3, add it back to 6, and that's 9. Well, guess what? That's original. It's a novel way of solving it, and it's mathematically accurate and thereby creative. Now, what do we do with this first kid? Do we just let his, this little aspiring poet kind of <laughs> languish and the seedling die before our eyes? No, I, I mean, I think one, one beautiful quote that's been attributed to Miles Davis, the American gra jazz greats, and he attributes it to jazz. He says, in jazz, there are no wrong notes, only notes in the wrong places. So I think as educators, we also have a responsibility to help kids understand how to read the context and understand that in this context, it's probably not task appropriate, meaningful, effective to write a poem, but let's find the context where that is meaningful mm -hmm. and appropriate. So when I do that by way of example, I try to illustrate what we mean by this combination of originality, meeting task constraints as defined within the context, and also to kind of plant the seed that creativity isn't always necessary. Right? Mm -hmm. That there are times when it's much more effective and efficient to do the try and true way. But when we're confronted with uncertainty, that's a good signal that we may need to think and act in new ways. So Beautiful. I'll flip it up. Thank you. So that brings us to, to Mark. You have been at this for a while. You're at the Torrance Center. So you're in a position where you're representing a pioneer in the field with a mission to focus on creativity. You've written an article on the standard definition of creativity. So how do you describe creativity to others? Can't I just say ditto? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, you can't. <laughs> I'm third, ditto. <laughs> um, You'll be first I, I for the next so question. I so much I liked and uh, would reiterate the idea of the spectrum, for mm. example. In fact, when I thought about the, the question of definitions, I had to stand back and think how basic that seems, but how wonderful it is that it's being debated and that there are uh, discussions and dialogues and there's new research, even on the definition, which the field's been around a while and yet we're still debating the definition. I think that's a terrific thing, uh, especially because people do appreciate uh, the idea of a spectrum and a range of definitions, which of course becomes very important if you start asking about parents and teachers and as, as well as researchers. And I have to say that um, I spent uh, 25 years of my career arguing that we could be scientific about creativity and attempting to be objective and argue that we can be objective and scientific. I was told not to do a dissertation on creativity in 1983, and uh, I did. Um, uh, so I, I started with a, a workable operational definition, and uh, I, I wasn't alone in, in developing the standard definition. I recently looked at, I just looked through history and came up with a nice balance or blend, I think Ron said, originality and effectiveness. And uh, you can communicate those ideas pretty broadly and communicate the idea that there's more to creativity than originality. And you have to do that both because that's what creativity is, a nice blend, but also because originality can scare people. They think uh, their kids or their children or students are gonna be weird if they're just original and it can go too far. Uh, my starting point, my operational point is the, the, uh, the standard definition and some blend of originality and effectiveness. Uh, personally, I, I have a little bit different view, and I sometimes attempt to communicate that. I'll try it now. Um, I, I really believe that we are going to get the most bang for our buck by looking at individuals. I think uh, social impact is very critical, and, and I'm sure it'll come up uh, later in this conversation. But I think creativity starts with individuals. And uh, studying cognitive psychology for decades, and that just sounds so weird. Decades, me, but it is. Um, I, I, I think there is uh, more than enough research to support the idea that creativity is very literal on a cognitive level. We create meaning. We construct, or Piaget said, invent meaning. And I think that's where creativity starts, with the construction of original and effective interpretations of our experience. And I think that's a, an incredibly important target for education, to give children the ego strength and the attitudes and the strategies and the confidence to uh, put effort into constructing their own interpretations of their experience. It does create a few 
uh, hurdles and obstacles in education, all of which I think we can deal with. Uh, and and I, again, I think that's entirely consistent with uh, what we know about the brain and cognitive psychology, networks and systems in the brain and so on. In terms of communicating, uh, I do often approach it from the other angle, which is consistent with what I'm hearing. I probably always quote uh, Jerome Bruner that we must prepare our children for the unforeseeable future. And that is more true today than ever before, even though he said that in about 1970, uh, with the acceleration of uh, cultural and technological changes. So true today, and people realize that. Parents realize that, teachers realize that. And the best way to prepare our children for the unforeseeable future is to ensure that they are creative. They are self-expressive. They are uh, capable of thinking in an independent and original fashion. What, wow, that's remarkable. And I want to zero in on something that you said about your dissertation. And okay. you had an option. In fact, you received pushback. And you persisted in terms of that topic. And all of you have had choices in terms of where you want to spend your energy. And one of the things that we like to do in the Dissecting Creativity program is to also get your story. So I'm going to ask you if each of you would briefly talk from a personal perspective. Why is it important to you? So Mark, you've started several journals. You've moved into a position where you're promoting this with doctoral students. For you, why the interest in creativity? That's actually not an easy question to answer. Uh, I'm tempted to say something like intrinsic motivation. <laughs> uh, I did have uh, pressure to be practical, and not just with not doing that dissertation, but even before then, uh, there were an enormous number of professors of psychology when I was starting my doctoral work. I did it anyway, because uh, I wasn't thinking about the job, I was thinking about a meaningful and engaging life. And I knew mm -hmm. studying cognitive psychology and creativity in particular, uh, it's what I wanted to do. It was the process and the journey that I wanted mm -hmm. to take. And I was um, discounting uh, the practical uh, side mm -hmm. of, of the future and the job. And I've, I've been enormously lucky. I've had a job, great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I've been able to continue studying creativity. Uh, so I suppose some of it is uh, you know, the, the intrinsic motivation. Yeah. And I've always thought that uh, I'm, I'm an incredible dingbat, so you know, it's great that I'm a professor. Uh, I, I, I often use that as an excuse, especially daily with my wife. Um, why'd you do that? I'm a professor. Give, give me a break here. I'm, I'm lost in you know, the my ivory, thoughts, uh, yeah. ivory tower. And, uh, so you know, there's, a, there's, I guess, a, a match of personality and, yeah. and topic and, and career. Um, and I, I actually don't reflect on that too much. Uh, uh, my brother's a professional artist, and he loves to read and hear about creativity. Uh, it's a, it's a one-way conversation with I, ha I have with him, and he's often said, if it ain't busted, don't fix it. <laughs> of course, quoting Will Chamberlain and a bunch of others. And, and he's right, um, and in a way, you know, that's, that's my uh, feeling as well. I'm, I'm lucky, I'm doing what I love. Uh, th there are practical implications of the field and the research. Um, so I don't stand back and reflect unless I happen yeah. to be. <laughs> well, that's why you're being interviewed. Facing with yeah. John in a, a panel. Well, and don't skip over, as we all know, uh, those of us who are passionate about studying creativity, the value of intrinsic motivation yeah. and the benefits of what you've produced for yeah. us as a consequence of your passion. So Ron, you've had choices across your career. Why, why the interest in creativity? What does it mean for you personally? Well, I'd say, so, you know, thinking about it from a professional vantage point, because I have some, you know, early experiences, too, that um, kind of play a role, probably later in my program of research. But I think what kind of was the catalyst for me, I started teaching about 25 years ago as a classroom teacher, and I had a group of students that kind of appeared at my door one day. I mean, they were in my classes, but after school, and they're like, we want you to coach us in Odyssey of the Mind. I had no idea what Odyssey of the Mind was. <laughs> so my first thing, as I think, you know, as a responsible teacher was, you should probably, if you're wanting somebody to coach you, seek out a coach that knows what they're going to be coaching you in. I have no idea of anything about creative problem solving or Odyssey of the Mind. But they were adamant. Um, I was their last hope. And so <laughs> I was like, OK, I've never seen you so motivated by anything. So um, they ended up winning the state championship. Now, this is in Wyoming, so it's a very tiny, it's a big state, but not many people. <laughs> um, I was coach of the year, but it was all them. And we went to the world finals. 
And it was an unsettling experience for me. So it was inspiring, but it created a lot of uncertainty for me because I was thinking, how is it that this group of kids, this same group of kids, this same teacher in this same classroom at about an hour and a half later than when I normally see them, are com it's qualitatively different experience. Mm. And why is it that I can't capture some of this magic, whatever it is, and bring it into the everyday classroom? And, um, and so that kind of started me on my journey. So I did a master's degree in, in creative problem solving, my, my, uh, district or my master's thesis was on creative problem solving. Then I went to Indiana and studied um, creativity with Jonathan Plucker. And we would always muse about, wow, there's so many connections with learning theory, with Piaget, Vygotsky, Dewey, but it's not appearing in the field of education. You can find it when I started out. And so when I first got hired, um, 15 years ago as an assistant professor at the University of Oregon, my well-intended department chair sat me down after my first year review and basically said, you know, um, you should probably study something that you can get tenure in. <laughs> um, and I just want to tell you that creativity's dead. And he took down the big, huge volume of the AERA um, annual uh, catalog from last year's meeting, and we flipped through and he's like, show me creativity anywhere in those pages. And I couldn't find it. And he said, you know, really, I'm just trying to help you out. You should probably study something like standardized assessments or, you know. And, I'm, and so I was, again, in this moment of uncertainty. And I went to AERA that year. And I, in some kind of back room, there was tables and, there was, and, and Jane Pirto was there. So the, it was under the, like, the guise of gifted. But there was some creativity <laughs> there. So I just went there. And I started telling this story, you know, poor is me. Woe is me. You know, my department chair is telling me not to pursue this. Um, and what am I going to do? And she reaches across the table and grabs me by my jacket. <laughs> and she says, if you believe that crap, you're dead. She says, you do not sell your intellectual soul to this situation. You lower your head and do the work. You have a responsibility. You know that there's something important about this work. You've seen it. You have a responsibility to communicate that. And so that was like a creative angel that appeared for me, right? Um, which is really important. And so I would say it were th those kinds of moments where I would be, you know, at turns inspired and then knocked off my rocker and in, in put into this moment of uncertainty. And that, those kinds of moments of trying to productively resolve the uncertainty I was facing has been the thing that just has kept me nourished, um, I think, throughout my career. That's a remarkable story. I can see Jane reaching across. Oh, yeah. She's <laughs> not a bashful person, big personality. So wonderful story. Also, you, you brought back a very bad memory for me. <laughs> so my own very quick story, I, w I was at a, another university looking for a PhD program. I had been admitted to three programs. I went to interview the department chairs. This was in industrial organizational psychology university, not to be named, but it's across town. Um, <laughs> and as I was speaking with the IO, chair and I was doing work in organizations and I could see that there was an interest in creativity he said you know you're a wonderful candidate Gerard we're really happy you're entering our program however you're going to have to get over your interest in creativity I didn't end up going there so so Yale you've had an interesting um, trail in terms of your travels and and being at Sheridan uh, working there as an administrator and the strategic initiative to make creativity a, a, a focus. Um, so talk about how you ended up in this and your, uh, your initial entree into this wonderful world of creativity. Mm -hmm. So you know we always talk about purposeful creativity at Sheridan. And so the first thing I have to say is that I ended up here completely by accident uh, with, <laughs> with no intention at all. Um, in fact, my training is in literary studies. My PhD looked at uh, my dissertation. You know, I looked at conceptions of, and representations of madness in literature and social settings and clinical settings too. And even back then, it was very interdisciplinary. And I was advised a lot to think about my future and how I would get a job uh, with a cross-disciplinary sort of um, type of work. But that's where I come from. And one of the things you said, Juan, really struck me. Uh, I made my life mission to, to pay attention to meaning and how we produce meaning and what constitutes you know, reason versus madness or sense versus nonsense. And, um, 
And so my whole career focused on discourse analysis and the ways by which we construct meaning. And I think at its fundamental core, this has something to do with it. Um, as a child, I moved to Canada without speaking a single word of English um, at the age of 12 or so. And I remember entering the school system. And you can imagine how it feels for a child to not understand. But where I come from, academics is really, really important. And academic performance is, you know, it kind of determines who you are. And uh, it's a huge value culturally and, and personally, too. And so I had this drive to, you know, to demonstrate that although I didn't speak the language right away, I was competent. Um, and so I remember sitting in a math class. I came from Israel, so we were a little bit more advanced, I guess, in, the, in that particular grade in math, what we did first um, here in Canada, or in Canada we did later. So I remember doing a math test, and it was something I've already learned, and I was able to perform really well in it, even though math wasn't my best subject where I came from. And lo and behold, I became the math genius of that class because I was able to speak <laughs> the language of mathematics, and, you know, and on and on it went. And I happened to pursue mathematics, actually, later on, and did really well in high school and in my undergrad. I took it as a sort of minor. And uh, at the same time, also followed my passion in literary studies. And I always tell this one story because I think it somehow resonates with how I ended up getting here. But in one of my classes, in my literature classes, I had to write an essay on a story by an author named Michael Andachi. It was a short story. And in the story, there happened to be a lot of references to numbers. The story really had to do with um, social dynamics. There were a lot of references to numbers here and numbers there. And I was also taking a, a mathematics class at the same time. And then my whole interpretation of that text rested on the numbers in the story. And I had it in my head that absolutely all the characters, you know, there was a, followed the equation of an elliptical uh, shape. And there were two foci points. And I did all the calculations and all the distances and the numbers and the ways by which the characters related all matched up to the numbers. Um, and with my paper, I attached a mathematical equation and a diagram uh, to demonstrate how my interpretation of the story, which had something to do with uh, social interactions, really rested on these mathematical equations. And that's, that essay made its way around the English department. And um, about a year or so, maybe two years later, I actually met the author and was so excited to approach him about this message and about mathematics. I was sure that that was his intention. And of course, he knew nothing about it. Um, <laughs> numbers meant nothing to him, although the interpretation stood. Um, and it was just, you know, my own way of constructing meaning and, and you know, as an individual making my, my, my way through the labyrinth of the narrative that has surrounded me at that time. And I feel like that's sort of been my trajectory uh, for a long time. And then coming to Sheridan, working there in humanities and social sciences and really interested in how we construct frames of references. And we're all about collaboration these days. How can one really enable meaningful collaboration? When we talk about interdisciplinary, it really has to do with opening up a disciplinary lens, a way of understanding, and applying it to a foreign disciplinary object. And how do we enable those meaningful interactions to produce innovation? So Sheridan uh, was really committed to creativity. We'll mm. sure talk about that for its 50-year history. Um, and I was compelled and asked to go and visit this International Center for Studies in Creativity at Buffalo State, which wasn't too far away, just to figure out what they're doing there and how that might actually help us with what we're doing here. And my first response was, really? I've never been to Buffalo. And fine, I'll go. <laughs> um, <laughs> and off we went and made it. Um, and then we heard Gerard talk about creative problem solving and the principles of creativity and how you know, that relates to the cognitive processes of new thinking. And right away, the wheel started turning. And I started thinking about you know, our, my own field of study and my interests. And, um, I think the rest was history. So, yeah, I ended up here how I ended up here personally. But I do believe there's a great purpose, and, and, and I think I have a responsibility, as do we all, to, to carry that through. And it's a remarkable yeah. story, too. In terms of the success at Sheridan College with the thousands of students who are enrolled in creativity courses now and, and hundreds who are pursuing the certificate. Mm -hmm. So we're going we're gonna to zoom out. Uh, we probably have time for a couple of more questions. Um, and I'm going to set up one, but then I'm going to make a comment to the studio audience. So just so you can begin to think about the trends. And for our editors, you've had a chance. You're reading manuscripts all the time. The trends that you see, what are, what's an exciting direction that you see in terms of creativity research? 
And as an educational leader, and especially perhaps from a slightly different perspective in Canada, you know, what, what do you see happening in, in education and, and where it's going relative to opening up to, to creative thinking? And to our audience here, cards have been distributed, so if you have questions at the end of our segment, we'll open it up uh, for questions that you have. Uh, doctors Cabra and Burnett will be collecting those, and we'll, we'll take about 15 minutes to pose some of your questions to our, to our experts. So, Mark, we're going to bounce back to you. You, uh, you launched a journal. You've now launched two new journals for the field, which I assume are based on your observations of, of trends and conversations, uh, the business creativity and the creative economy and the uh, journal of genius and eminence. Mm -hmm. So with your long view in terms of looking at creativity research, what, what excites you uh, about trends? What do you see coming up? Well, I've got to be brief because I've got some manuscripts to read. Yeah, I'm sure you do, yeah. <laughs> um, well, I, I, I think there are some very clear trends. In terms of those two journals, it was very obvious to me, editing the Creativity Research Journal and, and reviewing for other journals, uh, that uh, you know, topics were emerging and gaining attention. The creative economy and creative industry certainly has uh, been booming now for a few years. Uh, and there, there were indications that uh, the other journal, Journal of Eminence, uh, Genius and Eminence, also uh, there was an increase, uh, especially if you look at that topic or those topics, Genius and Eminence is uh, capturing any form of high achievement. And that's uh, what you do see in, in the, the journal. That is, it's not just uh, label genius as you see on TV or, or the like. It's, uh, we have uh, Olympic athletes uh, being studied and, and across domains. And so part of it's just critical mass of those two general topics. Uh, thinking within, especially the, the first two of those, well, I, I, actually all three, you, you would have to mention the neurosciences. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a new so a society for the neuroscience of creativity. There's a ton of research being done. And it's really uh, broadly defined. There's terrific work on uh, genetics and uh, influence of dopamine and dopamine receptors and the systems and networks of the brain. Uh, there really is an enormous amount of work uh, being done in, uh, in that area, and that's really exciting. It's a little bittersweet because there are growing pains. I, I really uh, am, am disappointed that the neuroscientists aren't looking at uh, more of the creativity research, but uh, it, they'll, they'll come around, and, <laughs> and especially because uh, uh, there are people like editors telling them what theory and, and previous research they should be considering. But the neurosciences have to be right there. Uh, personally, and not far behind, uh, I think relates to some of what we were heard, heard here, especially about Sheridan, and it has to do with uh, social benefit, social impact. Mm -hmm. And I'm thrilled that we are seeing several lines of work, creativity in the moral domain, and then kind of the flip side of that, uh, the dark side of creativity. Uh, but creativity in the moral domain, uh, Sternberg and others are looking at creativity and ethics and ethical citizenship. And this is enormously important material. There's a little bit bringing in economics and uh, politics. Uh, don't get me started. But these social <laughs> issues are, mm. are um, gaining attention. And of course, there's a little bit of a lag. They are a little bit behind the neurosciences. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is energy and interest, terrific work being done. And I actually expect them to uh, surpass all other topics uh, mm. in the next few years. So I'll, I'll mention mm -hmm. neurosciences and then the social impact, social responsibility sorts yeah. of research. Yeah. Certainly, it's been interesting going back to the Institute of Personality Assessment and Research and the individual focus, fully mm -hmm. agree, broadening to more social mm -hmm. issues um, and it, large scale right. studies yeah. looking at social issues. So, wonderful. So, Ron, yeah, so Journal I, of Creative Behavior, editor, yes. you're reviewing manuscripts all the time as well. What's your sense for the trends? I mean, trends? I would echo uh, some of the things that trends that Mark is saying. Um, and so I, I think it's interesting that we're going from this kind of micro material basis when, as we look at like neurophysiological basis, there's a lot of interest there, all the way out to, you know, what are we talking about with social, global, and future impact? So there's this beautiful mm -hmm. kind of trajectory um, and a great deal of interdisciplinary work and a great deal of international work, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think there's a lot happening and, and there's almost, 
uh, there's a proliferation, so it's hard to kind of find the signal through the noise, if you will. Mm -hmm. But I think some of the things that really resonate with me and I think are really critically important to, to think about is, are some reconceptualization. So Mark talked about this too, that people are looking again and again at things like, what do we mean by the definition? Um, but also looking at how do we even think about this phenomena of creative thought and action. And so some of the work that's exciting for me are these kind of more dynamic perspectives on this. And kind of well thought out, very structured, everything from you know, the philosophical, theoretical, conceptual thought about what is creativity as a dynamic phenomenon. So for things, for example, what, what serves as a catalyst for creativity. So as I mentioned, uncertainty is something that's interesting for me. What are these kind of different trajectories when people are engaging with creative thought and action? And even creative products, kind of raising questions, is a creative product ever totally finalized? Can we take a dynamic product or perspective on something that seems finished and say, you know, maybe the, these things can be reinterpreted? So as interesting and compelling those things are, concomitant with that, I would say, are really interesting methodological and analytic work looking at these kind of dynamics. So just to give you two quick examples, um, I think work that's looking at, and it, it, some of my own work has kind of been inspired by this and, and moving in this direction. So how do we capture, like in the context of a classroom, there are opportunities for kids to share out ideas, test their ideas out, but that's kind of ephemeral, it kind of disappears. So how can you kind of trace that out? How can you make a physical record of opportunities for, and patterns of discourse? Right, so it kind of gets into discourse analysis. But beyond just looking at the transcript, can you create some visual patterns of representation? So the typical classroom, you know, the teacher asks a question, a student responds, and it's quickly evaluated and repeats. So you get these really steep, like, ski slope patterns. All right, so versus another classroom where a teacher might ask a question, a student says something, another student elaborates on this idea, and so you see these ideas kind of being hanging out here and even suspending, and then a new idea emerges, and they go back and reconnect it and reanimate these ideas. And so using those kinds of, so that's kind of a qualitative way of measuring, or not measuring, but representing this kind of dynamic phenomena. And then can you situate that in quantitative work that says, if we classified classrooms by different vari quantitative variables, would we see these different patterns emerging? So work like that. And then I think critically important, um, and it kind of speaks to some of the, the presentations we heard earlier today, looking at the individual variants. So Mark and I were talking about how variance is everything, right? In the, in, it plays a huge role when we think about creativity. So a big topic is creative self-beliefs, for example. But two people could have almost identical, on average, creative self-beliefs, but perform very differently. And I think that's an artifact of how we measure these things, but also how we analyze the data. So if we measure more dynamically, like before somebody engages in a task and take these kind of systematic momentary assessments and then look at even the retrospective beliefs, instead of kind of averaging those together, using um, analytic techniques that allows us to look at these different patterns, right, of variation. And then we can start testing out, does somebody who has consistently high creative confidence, for example, actually perform better than somebody that has these really high sweeps of, you know, I'm confident now, but now I run into this problem and I, I, I'm almost mm -hmm. gonna give up, but I came back in. So we can look at different patterns um, at that kind of micro, longitudinal, micro uh, developmental way. So I think that kind of work is really interesting That's and fascinating. fascinating to me. Yeah. And you give great examples of what that dynamic may look like in the context of the classroom and, and education, which, Gail, yeah, brings us to, to you. And as an educational leader and being sensitive, especially at Sheridan College, which has rebranded itself, you, you, you put out in the in the forefront as a way of communicating what the institution stands for is, is creativity, share it and get creative. See, I even know the tagline. So wh where do you see the trends in terms of education? Because I see Sheridan in some ways trying to get out on the leading edge of that trend and, and try to be a catalyst for change in education. Sure. So as you know, Gerard, the Conference Board of Canada released its latest iteration a couple of years ago now, a few years ago, of the Innovation Skills Profile 2.0, which lists um, the top required skills in today's graduates um, upon graduation in order to increase innovation performance in organizations of all types, big and small, across Canada. And for the first time, creativity and creative problem solving were at the very top of the list alongside risk-taking skills and relationship building and others. 
Um, and so I think there is no denying that there is a recognition in post-secondary institutions now across Canada that creative problem-solving skills, what we typically refer to as creativity skills, are absolutely required as 21st century skills um, within the classroom. And I received the um, Academica Top 10 Daily Digest um, in Canada that lists the latest news and opinions relevant to post-secondary education in Canada across uh, the country. And it is not uncommon, in fact, very common every day when I open up my email to see an innovation center popping up in one college, uh, an entrepreneurship hub popping up in another college, experiential opportunities for students, lots of funding coming from the government and from the private sector to promote innovation performance and contribute to our innovation uh, performance in Canada. So I think there's no question that there is recognition there. How many of those institutions are formalizing uh, that learning within a program such as you do here um, or such as we do at Sheridan? I'm not sure and I think we are unique in um, leading at the forefront of that. So Sheridan has taken its commitment to creativity very seriously. Um, Sheridan's always had, we have the largest art school in Canada, so has always had a reputation for creativity. That's not anything new. Um, what we've done deliberately is try to recognize creativity across all of our programs um, and disciplines. And so we have formalized programs. We deliberately think about the way that space and place contributes to the creative learning environment. Uh, we've paid close attention to processes. So we've had our colleagues from the International Center for Studies in Creativity um, come in and facilitate some creative problem solving workshops for staff and faculty just as a way, as a, as a teaser, um, as a way of promoting opportunities for people to engage in creative processes. And we've sought out relationships with like-minded institutions. I think, I think there's something to be said about formalizing the education in that area beyond recognizing the skills. So we're going to continue the conversation specifically looking at Sheridan. I've been handed the questions from our audience. And in fact, the first question is for you. So this is perfect segue, <laughs> perfect timing. The question is, what has been the impact of bringing creativity to Sheridan? What have you seen as concrete examples of the impact of this strategic initiative and all the efforts in terms of uh, coursework for students or faculty? Can you speak to impact? That is such a good question. Um, the f I just want to start by, ans by answering the first part of it, which is bringing creativity to Sheridan. I wouldn't say to Sheridan. I wouldn't say we've brought creativity to Sheridan. I think this is an authentic feature of uh, the identity of Sheridan and has been for its entire history, although it has manifested in different ways throughout the years. And the impact, however, are very deliberately paying attention to creativity across disciplines, um, I feel has been really positive, so has enabled folks from across the organization to collaborate potentially more readily. Uh, but for us, it's really a question of articulating what it is that constitutes creativity across these various fields. So we've talked about the spectrum at the beginning. It's very easy to alienate uh, people by speaking about creativity in a way that doesn't necessarily resonate with them. And what we've tried to recognize is the ways in which each disciplinary area or each field of, field of study um, enables new ways of thinking or engages in some form of the creative process. And so the commitment to the creative campus at Sheridan is it's really a commitment to enabling creativity in our programs, in our people, um, in our processes, in our place and space. The development of the Board Undergraduate Certificate in Creativity and Creative Problem Solving, which is endorsed by the International Center for Studies in Creativity, has been hugely impactful. And I really appreciate this question because that was a big question mark for us from the very beginning. So we've collaborated with colleagues from here uh, to design the six courses that are available to students throughout their degree program, whatever degree program they're enrolled in. And they're beautifully developed. They meet all of the requirements of the humanities and social sciences. We check off all of the ministry requirements. Uh, they achieve amazing things as far as we're concerned in terms of learning outcomes. But the big question was, will they actually impact students and will, will they be popular? Will students feel the same way? They don't have to take these courses. Um, and so it's been a huge relief and actually quite inspiring for us to see students clamoring to take these courses. Um, 
in droves. In fact, they fill within 24 hours of registration. The courses fill. There's huge demand for them. Students from a range of programs, you know, ranging from animation, illustration, athletic therapy, um, sciences, community studies, take these courses, and they have wonderful things to say. Um, we've graduated our first cohort of about 50 students. Um, way earlier than we expected because students took those six courses way faster than we expected throughout the, the course of their four-year degree program. So I think it has an impact. I think it's best to hear it from the students themselves. What I'm curious to see on that note um, is if we can track the impact as they leave us and go out into the workforce and go out to further studies or whatever it may be. That would be a wonderful uh, project for us to work on. Thank you. Excellent. So we'll turn from impact on students, back to a trend question again. This is a fascinating question again from the audience. I'm gonna pose this to Ron and to Mark. Ron, I'm gonna give you the first opportunity to respond to this. The question is, creativity has become a hot topic. Do you think we should be concerned about this trend fizzling out? How do we protect for creativity fatigue? And then there's a parenthetical note here. I've heard professors at universities uh, say it's over. It's already over. <laughs> so, Ron? Yeah, and I, I'll speak to this from kind of the perspective of work in educational settings. Um, I think educational settings, particularly K-12 settings, get inundated with all kinds of different um, fads and techniques and so on. And so I think one of the key things is helping folks understand the kind of deep historical and theoretical and empirical roots of some of this work. And so kind of helping folks understand that, yes, I think if we just live on the surface with some techniques, like if you just design, if you just create maker spaces in a school, it's not like creativity is gonna happen magically there, right? So I think people have to understand the principles underlying that, and then they can see the s sustainability of that. So some work that um, I've been involved in, and, and other people, do this kind of work, and it was like in John's presentation today too, I would consider this a legacy challenge. So I think what I try to help folks understand is, can we create opportunities for young people in very structured ways to learn how to put their academic learning to creative use, right? And so part of the problem is in, in schools, we tend to over plan students' learning experiences. So can we unstructure some of those things to give them some kind of confidence and experience with uncertainty, but more importantly, push them to push their learning outside the walls of the classroom. And so the idea then is if we can give them the opportunity to, and these very simple four questions of, you def define what is the problem, why does it matter, what are we gonna do about it, and most importantly, what is the lasting legacy that this solving this problem is gonna make on people, right? So it's, it's about pushing things out and then curating the work, right? Mm -hmm. So that people can see, wow, you know, I restored that bus stop, right? I did that when I was in fourth grade or whatever it is, right? I helped, you know, create this rooftop garden and now it's helping feed hungry families in my community. And so when you have that kind of thing, you don't need statistical analysis for that. It meets um, the interocular traumatic test it hits you right between the eyes, right? And you can say, okay, there is something here, right? And I think, but we need that. Otherwise, I think it, there is danger that it could just be seen as yet another thing, right? And it can quickly disappear. So I think it needs to be deeply situated in the principles of, of the field, but also has to demonstrate its value. And I think we have a responsibility as researchers and practitioners to demonstrate and curate that work and so other people can see um, the impact that in fact it is making. Really appreciate the response and unknowingly you also have foreshadowed the final question. Okay. So picking on a word you used, legacy. Okay. Just to build a little bit of anticipation, to build a little <laughs> anticipation, the last question is about the creativity legacy. But before we move to that. Okay. So Mark, creativity fatigue, a, a concern about the topic, uh, evaporating, being, can I swear? Worn out. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing comes to mind is profanity. That's just silly. Um, I have to admit, uh, 20 years ago or 25, when I was studying creativity, and there was one journal before the Creativity Research Journal, um, I, I wondered if, uh, and things started to accelerate. I think I did way back when think, you know, is it peaking? 
and it kept going up and it kept going up and it's gone up for 35 years that I've been watching. Uh, and I don't think it's, uh, we're, we're, uh, I haven't experienced any fatigue. I'm receiving feedback from students, from industry, from educators, uh, from people who uh, see creativity on TV or read a book about it, uh, that they're relieved that it's finally being recognized. And, and I think uh, my explanation of that or interpretation is really that creativity is an enormous part of what it means to be human. I really don't think you are in touch with life and fulfilling your potential as a human unless you're creative. I, and I don't think you have to call it creativity, but I think this is why it resonates with so many people. They have the drive to be self-expressive and playful and to experiment and to think with, consider options. Uh, it, it is human to be creative. So to have creativity as a field, especially one which is interdisciplinary, uh, I think is a relief to people. They're, they're, they, and we're just going to appreciate it more and more and more as we find the connections and the applications and bring it into education and industry. And of course, the payoffs are there. You know, it, it is uh, the statistics earlier, and I think, Yale, you mentioned some. Uh, industry uh, is just crazy for innovation. They realize how important it is, and, and it is important. It, it, it's not going to end. The, the demand is there. The supply is still a little bit behind it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, because creativity is a part of what it means to be human, I don't think it will ever end. And I have never experienced anybody that said, I'm tired of it. So you're saying I have job security. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks, Mark. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. There are other issues there. <laughs> there are other issues. Thanks. Well, I was about to say how much I've enjoyed this conversation. And sadly, it has to end. Um, but a, a question came in again from our audience here and, and Ron to a word that you use that is a powerful word, legacy. And this last question really relates to legacy. And this is a, a question that uh, has you thinking in a big way, a, a dream or a wish for the field of creativity. And the question is, what do you hope uh, to see solved in your lifetime or an application of creativity uh, in terms of the world uh, and its impact. Where would you like to see creativity go in terms of, of its impact? And I'm gonna leave it to you in terms of the frame uh, with which you would like to respond to that. That can be uh, at a social level, could be research, could be specifically in, in education. So you can frame it however you, you wish. And I'm gonna leave it open to you all in terms of who wishes to respond first. Paper, scissors, rock? <laughs> Paper, scissors, rock. <laughs> okay. Mark, you look like sure. you go uh, for it. Yeah, there are so many um, uh, ideas bouncing around there. Uh, I ac actually, as you probably can tell, am, am really happy and pleasantly surprised with trends, with the attention, with the progress being made. Uh, I, I do think of things like a better understanding of the neuroscience and the neuroanatomy and neurochemistry of creativity, uh, but I actually think we're, we're making enormous progress there. Um, I, I, I suppose if you think about uh, hurdles or problems to solve, uh, there is still resistance. Uh, and uh, of course I'd like to see less resistance in particular areas. And, one fairly common form of resistance is actually related to the cost of expertise. As people become established in fields and develop knowledge bases, uh, there is a little bit of resistance to creativity and new things. And, and you can see that, um, it, it, forgive me, but you can see it in politics uh, and, and people in positions of power, uh, but really to a certain degree in, in, uh, at the highest levels. And so, too often I see people who realize that creativity is a good thing, creativity sells, uh, and they give it lip service, and they're not really open to it. And I think it's because of this cost of expertise and the resistance that grows as you become invested in a method or field or business. And so I'd really like to see that uh, conflict between uh, openness to what is new and true creativity and innovation 
I, I would like to think that uh, we get over the cost of expertise and that we uh, we get past some of the hurdles that, that I perceive. But but again, I you know that's that question. I, I'm in remarkably happy with uh, where the field is progressing and what we're learning and the impact. So um, you know that's that that question requires a little bit of imagination on my part. Heaven forbid. <laughs> And the topic is creativity. What could be more fitting? So continuing to, to think big and, and sure. dream, project into the future. Yeah, I mean, I think just echoing a couple ideas earlier, you know, the idea that as long as there's uncertainty, we're going to need creativity, which means we're always going to need creativity. <laughs> and the idea that it is part of our, it, it's just part of being human. I agree with that. So there's no, schools can't kill creativity, right? As long as they're, kids are in schools, they have the potential to be creative, and so do teachers. And so I think part of what I would say, what I would be hopeful for, is that folks start um, reclaiming their own creativity. And I think there's, there's a responsibility here. I think there's a responsibility to respond creatively in the face of mounting uncertainty. So, you know, one of the arguments I used to make why it's important in schools is because the primary goal of schools is to prepare young people for the future. So, you know, Mark spoke to that a little bit earlier. But the truth is, the present is so uncertain that we need <laughs> to prepare them for right now, right? How do you respond to uncertainty? And I think we need to provide opportunities for young people. Um, just like you can't learn to swim unless you get in the water, you know, you can't learn how to pr respond productively to uncertainty unless you have the opportunities to do that. But here's the responsibility component. I don't think it's fair to ask young people in places where there's a high level of conformity to take what I would call beautiful risks unless we ourselves are willing to do it ourselves, right? As parents, teachers, coaches, educators, we have to demonstrate our own willingness to take these kinds of beautiful risks. And what I mean by a beautiful risk is the costs um, are overshadowed by the potential benefits to us and to others, right? And so given that, again, I think it is a responsibility to respond creatively now more than ever, but always, right, to think, you know, when we don't know how to act, so when we face uncertainty, we can resolve it by ignoring it, trying to force fit old solutions, or we can take the responsibility and say, I'm gonna try to do something new and different, and it may not work, mm -hmm. but I'm gonna learn from this, and I'm gonna be persistent because there is a necessity, I think, um, at play. So that's what I would hope, is that people kind of reclaim that um, awareness that I can be creative and I must be creative in some situations, mm -hmm. right? So that responsibility component. I like your reframing, shifting from the future to, to now, this moment. So speaking of this moment, this moment is coming to an end. So Yale, you get the, the final word in terms of looking out into the future wishes. I think you're in an enviable, in my opinion, situation as a director of a creativity institute and still fairly fresh into this initiative and thinking about where it might go and its impact or however you wish to frame that, that mm -hmm. question. I think that sounded like a finale to me. It was so <laughs> good. Um, here's what I'll say, where I come from. I think our impulse is to compartmentalize knowledge and research and education, phases of education. And so to me, one of our greatest challenges and opportunities is to relax those um, boundaries and those parameters in order to really enable creativity to thrive. Creativity, as I mentioned to me, first and foremost is a field of study. It is cross-disciplinary. And so it's a delicate dance between um, applying it as a cross-disciplinary field of study that does not reside with any, just a singular uh, field of expertise, and at the same time maintaining its legitimacy and credibility. And I think that's where our real opportunity is. There are amazing new fields of knowledge that are produced based on the relaxation of the boundaries between disciplines. So narrative medicine, for example, it's an example that I always use because it's dear to my heart, the blending of narrativity studies with serious, weighty medical uh, research. And now you have medical humanities people talking about the importance of creativity and using that language of creativity and creative problem solving and creativity studies in medicine. Um, and so I think there are huge opportunities for us, and I do feel like it's our responsibility to really also pay attention to how it is that we affect and shift a shift in the organization of knowledge and research and how we deliver education then on that front. Appreciate that. Yeah. 
So you talked about the finale. That does bring our time to an end. Um, sadly, I wish we could continue the, the dialogue. I've had the opportunity now to lead several dissect and creativity sessions. Um, when it's done within the context of the creativity expert exchange, I think it brings even more meaning to it. So I want to express my deep gratitude for you all uh, in this exchange to share your, your thoughts and ideas with us. And really, thanks for being open to move beyond just the surface academic response and really reveal, in my opinion, some of your strong passion about the, the subject area. So the exchange will continue uh, over lunch, which actually I can smell now. I'm beginning to, to <laughs> salivate. So recognizing that I stand between uh, lunch uh, and, uh, and continue on the dialogue. So the, um, the, the audience here will have an opportunity. I hope you'll uh, avail yourself of conversations with them uh, and Ron and Yale, especially later this afternoon with the focus group uh, that will meet you uh, again. Uh, small hint here, those who've been invited, Rockwell Hall 304 at 4.30. Uh, audience, if you would please um, uh, join me in a resounding round of applause and thanking our panelists. Thank you very much. And that brings our dissecting creativity segment to a conclusion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today.